Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, being here, for your interest. Um, so this is uh, the title of my talk. I hope it doesn't sound too... Oh, no. Go back. It doesn't sound uh, oh, too strange. Uh, and I have, um, I have decided to make it a colloquium talk, which means that um, if you're somewhat acquainted with the theory, you may have to wait for a little bit before things become interesting to you. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, if you are remote or even disjoint from this theory, then maybe uh, you will find it, uh, you will find at least the beginning interesting. Um, and in particular, um, I'm going to tell you what the periodic numbers are. Which is not quite true. I'm not going to tell you exactly what they are, but I'm going to try to convey at least a small bit of the flavor that they have. Um, and in order to do that, let's recall what the real numbers are. So we look at the rational numbers and we have a notion of absolute value on them. If we have a rational number, we know what its value is. And this absolute value gives a topology on the rational numbers with respect to which they're not complete. If we complete them, we get the real numbers, and uh, these form a field, they have a topology, and this topology has many nice properties, and two of them are that it's complete and it's locally compact. And uh, you can then ask, well, um, you can define other notion of norms or absolute value on the rational numbers, uh, which don't have such a geometric flavor, but rather are of a more arithmetic nature. And one way to define such a notion is to take fix a prime number p and say an integer is very close to zero if it's very divisible by p, if it's divisible by a high power of p. From the point of view of uh, this geometric absolute value, this is a very strange thing because then the sequence p to the n will go to zero and it goes to infinity in the usual absolute value. But you can check that this arithmetic kind of absolute value satisfies all the formal properties of an absolute value. And uh, it's going to give a topology on um, the rational numbers. And with respect to that, we can complete the rational numbers. And uh, this is the field of periodic numbers. It is actually a field. And uh, just like with the real numbers, it is complete and locally compact. Um, so the real symbiotics have some similarities, but they're also quite different. And I just want to po point out one particular case or one particular property in which they differ. Uh, the topological space of the real numbers is connected, whereas the periodic numbers are totally disconnected. They, they fall apart immediately just by looking at them. And uh, okay, so now we have periodic numbers. That's a certain field. We can take matrices with entries in that field. For example, we can take all matrices with n by n with determinant 1. They form a group under multiplication. And this group inherits a topology from the uh, periodic numbers and becomes a topological group. The topology is again uh, locally compact and totally disconnected. Another example of such a group would be to take uh, two by two n by two n matrices, which leave invariant a certain sim uh, um, symplectic form. This is a symplectic group, and those two topological groups are two examples of a general class of group called connected reductive periodic groups, and it's not hard to say what the general definition is, but it involves some more notation. So if you are not acquainted with it, just think of those two examples, uh, and they'll serve a good purpose. And uh, some people, including me, like to study representations of these groups. So what is a representation? It is simply a complex vector space together with a homomorphism from the group G to the automorphisms of that complex vector space. This homomorphism tells you how each element G acts on this vector space. Now, a word of caution is that in most cases, the vector space will be infinite dimensional. And um, so uh, it will not make sense to take a trace of an infinite dimensional matrix, but we'll still do it. We'll still, uh, if you can make sense out of it, or Harish Chandra can make sense out of it, what it means to take the, if you have an element in the group, take its image, which is an automorphism of E and take its trace. This works for almost all elements. This is signified by this prime here. G prime is a dense open subset of G on which this function taking the trace is defined and it's called the character of this representation. 
And before going on with representations is, uh, why are those things interesting? Why do people want to study uh, such objects? And uh, we had the talk of David two days ago, and then we take, had the talk of Andre today. They talked about automorphic representations and how those are very important for number theory, the relation being given by the Langlands program. And such automorphic representations, well, they break into a product of what are called local representations or factors, and these local factors are precisely such representations here. So a main chunk of the motivation to study them comes from number theory from the Langlands program, because these representations have a number theoretic significance. Um, okay, so what is a central interesting open problem in this theory? It is called the local Langlands correspondence. And the local Langlands correspondence seeks to parameterize representations of PID groups in terms of objects which are called Langlands parameters. Now what is a Langlands parameter? Maybe before I even say what a Langlands parameter is, I want to uh, make a slight philosophical remark. If you think of the group SLA and QP, or there, and if you are putting yourself in a mental situation that you will be examining its representation. So what kind of input goes into that theory? Well, you have the group theory of the group SLN. Those properties will play a role. And then you have the arithmetic of the, group of the field QP. So these two will somehow flow into. And uh, coming back to Langlands parameters, which are supposed to parameterize representations, these are homomorphisms, well, from one thing to another thing. Now the first thing is something very closely related to the Galois group of QP, the automorphisms of the, the algebraic closure of QP, which leave QP <coughs> fixed. And the right-hand side is something very closely related to G. It's called the Langlands dual group of G. And the Langlands dual group of G is constructed out of G in, in, a, in a very straightforward manner. And instead of giving it, I'll just give you uh, I'll just take the two examples which you had, the SLNQP and SP2NQP, and just tell you what G hat is. And uh, uh, my remark uh, that you have group theory and arithmetic coming into periodic representation theory, uh, if you remember that, you can see here that this Langlands correspondence has uh, the very nice property that it kind of separates those two inputs. You have on the left-hand side the arithmetic input, and on the right-hand side the group theoretic input, and they're kind of connected by this Langlands parameter. Uh, now what is known about it? Uh, well, not much. So the, the, the most important, somehow biggest uh, case in which it is known is the work of Harris, Taylor, and NER, which establish it for GLNQP for ON. So it's a very important, perhaps the most important, uh, tower, infinite tower groups, and not only do they establish this correspondence between Langlands parameters and representations, but they also show it is compatible with uh, a number of important arithmetic invariants attached to both the left and the right hand side. And then there are a few low dimensional examples, but apart from that, uh, the question is open. Um, and now, um, so let's now try to go to a more general group, and by a more general group I mean even SLN is more general than GLN in, in the sense that I'll, I'll tell you. I told you a Langlands correspondence is supposed to be a correspondence between Langlands parameters and representations, but it is not quite true. This is literally true for GLN, but for a more general group, even SLN, uh, a, Lang a single Langlands parameter is not going to correspond to a single representation, but rather to a finite set of representations. And this finite set of representations is called an L packet. So if you're trying to establish a local Langlands correspondence, you will be trying to match a Langlands parameter with some finite set of representations. But of course, you cannot just pick any finite set of representations. They have to belong together in a certain way. They have to satisfy some coherence properties. And two of the most important coherence properties are expressed by, by their characters, and they're called stability and endoscopic transfer. So let's first talk about stability. Uh, when will a finite set of representations uh, satisfy the condition of stability? That is easy to state. Um, let's imagine we took two elements of the group SLNQP, G and H. 
Now we can ask, are they conjugate in this group? But we can also ask another question, which is less restrictive, and that is, let's put them into the bigger group, SLN of QP bar, and let's ask if they're conjugate in there. Uh, it will happen that two elements G and H are not conjugate in the smaller group, but they are conjugate in this bigger group. So that gives us a broader notion of conjugacy. And a function is called stable if it takes the same value whenever the two elements are conjugate in this bigger group. And a finite set of representations uh, satisfies the stability condition if we take the character of each individual element, we take the sum, and then we ask that this function be stable, that it takes the same value on G and H. Now, uh, some people may object that this is not exactly on the nose true what I'm saying. It's true for SLN and it's true in many other cases. Sometimes you need to put a slight weighting factor in front, which I want to slip under the rug and say, basically you take the sum and you want that it be stable. So this is a stability condition. And the second condition which such a finite set has to satisfy in order to qualify for an L packet is the endoscopic transfer. And so let's discuss this condition. And now this is the only slide which is going to have a little bit of technical detail. So uh, 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 let's, uh, I, I, ho I hope it's OK. So the first thing is, before I can say what an endoscopic transfer is, I, uh, we need to discuss how individual elements in an L packet are supposed to be parameterized, or conjecturally parameterized. We know the L packet as a whole is, is corresponds to a Langlands parameter, but how do the individual elements of the L packet, uh, how are they parameterized? Well, remember that the Langlands parameter is a function phi from uh, the Ve de Lien group, which was this w, uh, w prime closely related to the Galois group, into g hat. So what we can do is we can take the centralizer group of uh, the, the, you can take the centralizer of the image of this function in g hat. Now, this is going to be a finite group or a finite modulo center group, and we can take its irreducible representations. They are going to be finite dimensional, and we can ask, uh, and, and it's conjecturally expected that they are in bijection with, with the set, with the, uh, the L packet corresponding to this Langlands parameter. And I just denote the bijection, an irreducible representation rho goes to pi sub rho. That's just the name for this bijection. So this is part of the conjectural theory. This is part of what is expected, how uh, members of the L packet are parameterized. And now, given an element in the centralizer, we can form two objects. For once, we can form a certain alternating combination of uh, the characters of elements in the L packet. Remember, in the stability condition, we just took the sum of all characters in the L packet. Now we're going to take the sum of all characters in the L packet, but we're going to put a weighting factor in front of each character. And this weighting factor is going to come from this S. And if, if, you, if you use the criminalistic approach and you know what data you're given, there is nothing other you can do than this. Um, uh, each element in here is parameterized by an irreducible representation here. And you can evaluate the irreducible representation of this group at that element S, and you can take its trace. Or in other words, you take the character of this irreducible representation at S. And this is the weighting factor you put in front of the character of the constituent of this L packet. So this is one object you can form. You can form another object from the same element S, and that is you can simply take the centralizer in G hat of this element S. Well, or, and this is going to be a reductive group. And just like we obtained G hat out of G, via this dualizing procedure, which I didn't explain, but I hinted at, we can reverse the dualizing procedure, and from H hat, we can obtain a periodic group H. Now, I'm just going to tell you that, and it's very easy to see if you sit down and look at it for a minute, the way the things are set up what is going to happen is that this Langlands parameter is going to, its image is going to land in H hat. This is pretty much obvious, which means that you're going to have now a Langlands parameter for H. While this observation on itself is trivial, what is non-trivial is if you believe in the Langlands correspondence, now this means that you're going to have an L packet on H, just like you have an L packet on G, 
and they're both corresponding to the same Langhans parameter. And uh, to this L packet on H, you can form the sum of characters, the thing that is supposed to be stable on H. And now the endoscopic character, the endoscopic character identities simply say that this alternating combination of characters on G is supposed to be equal to the stable combination of characters on H. Now you notice I've put quotation marks here, and that's because we are comparing apples and oranges. Uh, we have a function on G here, which is supposed to be equal to a function on H here. And although the w by construction H hat is the centralizer of some element in G hat, in particular H hat is a subgroup of G hat, it will almost always be the case that H is not a subgroup of G. So you cannot just compare things in, in a naive way. And in fact, to make sense of what this quotation mark mean, it's, it's a very technical part of the subject, and it's called uh, the theory of langland shellstadt transfer factors. But I, I don't want to talk about this. I just want to say that modulo this uh, non-trivial business, uh, you can make sense of this equality, and this equality are the endoscopic character identities, or what the second condition that a finite set of representations on G has to satisfy if it, in order to qualify to be an L packet. Uh, and uh, so what do people know about these things? Well, um, recently uh, the Barker and Rita have constructed L packets on a, on a very large class or a, a very general class of PID groups which correspond to a specific kind of Langlands parameters. And uh, one or the main result in the paper after they give the construction is the fact that those candidate L packets satisfy the stability condition. So they pass the first test to actually uh, be L packets. And uh, what uh, I recently work on is, worked on is to show that they indeed also satisfy the endoscopic character identities as well. And uh, once one has arrived at this, uh, at this point, there are multiple obvious things that one can ask. For example, the Bach and Reader have constructed these L packets on a large class of reductive groups. Well, can, how far can we enlarge this class? Can, can we make the construction work on a larger class of groups? And this is a work in progress. Extend this construction to a larger class of groups, and it involves not just, um, it involves actually finding a different way to do the same thing because their construction assumes very seriously the restrictions they have put on their groups. Um, so this has almost been done. And uh, the other thing that one can try to do is there is a more general theory of endoscopy called twisted endoscopy, which accommodates not only a group G, but an automorphism of that group. And one can ask, uh, well, no, one can ask, uh, do these L packets satisfy the twisted endoscopic character identity? So this is also an interesting question. Um, thanks.